Hello, I'm Julia. Dear Data, you've been following me for a while now, tracking, tracing, and mapping every aspect of my life. You followed where I've been, saw what I liked, noted what I bought, and you even know whom I loved. You made me into predictions, statistics, and assumptions, probabilities even. But I'm wondering, dear Data, do you know me or do you control me? Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here with me tonight. I'm Julia. And this is part of my installation, Dear Data, How Do You Decide My Future? And I'm going to show a couple of projects that I've been working on for the past years tonight and go a little bit more in depth into the research that I've done. So as an artist, I dedicate my practice towards these questions. How do we deal with fairness, equality, uh, democracy, autonomy, and all these kind of very core values in a data-driven society? What, do we, um, what are the challenges of digitalization in our society? And it's quite interesting to be an artist in this domain because we're facing many challenges. But it's really nice to make them, as Jörg already said, tangible, visible, understandable for a lot of people because people feel sometimes very far detached from their personal data, from the impact of the internet because the technology is given to us, the platformization, it's so good. It's so... It gives so much nice opportunities. But we also need to ask these kind of questions. So let's start with fairness today. Maybe you visited the Daily Mail once. The Daily Mail is a British, they claim a t news platform. I think it's more like a tabloid. But probably you can recognize that part of the screen will always be blocked by this big pop-up saying you have to accept the privacy policies. Well, probably the first thing you do is just click here on got it. Just accept you want to continue your internet journey. But what happens if you click on settings? Whoever does that? Ah, wow. <laughs> this is really unexpected. <laughs> nice. Well, you're a good audience. I like you. <laughs> Rooting for you. Okay, imagine that you didn't. Maybe five years ago you didn't. <laughs> okay, but there, I mean, do you then read the privacy policies? Maybe a different question. I mean, sometimes it occurs that that one click on got it actually allows more companies at the same time. Up to 531. 531 companies that all can analyze your data, follow your journey on the Daily Mail, and you legally accept that. It's really strange, right? And the way that I translate it, as Jörg already mentioned, is published all of these uh, privacy policies into this book, a very large book. Um, and I started to question, how can this, under the GDPR, the very much foundation of our digital civic rights, be informed consent? And informed consent is actually a very interesting matter, and I think it really matters to all of us here. Um, because with informed consent, it's saying that the data subject has given consent to the processing of his or her personal data for one of her or more specific reasons. And informed consent is a term that actually we, are, or the technology world, they loaned it from the medical and scientific practice. And it originates from a process when, uh, which in a healthcare provider educates a, pers a patient about the risk, the benefits, and the alternatives of a procedure before undergoing that procedure. Actually, informed consent has a lot of different values in, its, uh, in itself. There needs to be information given. So in the medical sector, the doctor or the medical professional, they have to give all the information about this procedure so that the patient can make an informed decision. The patient also needs to be able, cap cap capable of understanding that information. That's really questionable here. 
But most importantly, and that is what I want to focus on, there must be complete voluntariness. So making the decision, there must be no type of manipulation, coercion, or no, not given alternatives. So let's see what's happening actually here in the internet. All those values are reduced to just click here and continue your journey. Otherwise, uh, you probably can't. So I want to question volunteerness uh, briefly um, because people say like, well, if you don't want to accept it, you can just not, right? Well, already the design of that button that is really bright green gives you like a signal like, hey, you have to click here because the other option of not accepting or um, not accepting or um, the options given is sometimes not even visible for people. They're kind of, you know, blending in with the page. Another thing is that lately we, we see uh, the past years that they give you options. Do you want functional cookies and trusted third-party hosting cookies and analytical cookies and risk analytical cookies? Well, you have to be very well informed to understand all those different types of cookies, and I think most of the people are not. And it's just make you click a lot more, which is a lot of time that people don't want because they just want to access. So again, questionable volunteerness. Also, and this is actually not allowed, um, they block actually most of the access of the website or the, or the application if you don't accept. Um, the films won't load, the images won't load, content is blocked. So there again, it's not really volunteer uh, to click accept. And also we can say, well, then you just don't use the app, right? Because we're appealing to a people's responsibility. You have to be responsible for your choices. If you, want, if you don't want your data to be processed, just don't use the application. Well, I think in most cases, it's highly questionable whether it's really that a choice to do or not use an app. So questioning all these types of different types of layers of is it really informed consent, I thought, how can I make even a bigger impact with not just having this book with, as you can tell, many, 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 many pages, <laughs> York already told you a little bit about it, so now. Um, so I was thinking, what if we start reading this out loud? Um, so I started in 2019. I called the Dutch Design Week, which is a huge uh, event in the Netherlands. And I said, like, I want to do something really weird, but I want to do a privacy policy reading out loud marathon. <laughs> so I created this pop-up radio studio, place it outside on a square, and I had a radio studio to record the whole book, 831 privacy policies. So I started reading the first page myself, but it was also pretty clear that it would take up to 300, maybe 400 hours, depending also on your reading speed, but it's legal text in English, so probably not that fast. So I thought, I mean, I <laughs> dedicate my life to this, but I actually want to encourage people to also become a part of this. So people are recitally taking place in reading from the book for 12 minutes until this is finished, which is a very fun thing to do, but it's also very <laughs> labor intense and uh, taking a lot of time. And sadly, after a couple of sessions, we had to postpone the project because of COVID. But we did do even some um, quarantine-proof sessions, uh, not too many. Uh, but here you can see all different types of places where we went with the project. And so far, about 350 people have participated, which led up to about 80 hours of recordings. And we're not even one-third of the whole book. So a lot more <laughs> to go. And one of the participants was Katalijne Buitenweg, and she's a former Dutch politician for the Green Left. And she actually took the opportunity to take the book also to a parliamental debate about the future of the information society to also ask that same question, how can this be legally binding informed consent? There's nowhere near people can be informed about this. It's really intricate to understand this type of systems, let alone breeds. Um, so, yeah, that's been a nice journey. Again, sadly, due to GoFit. Um, I think this debate was on... March 11, 2020, and I'm not sure how it was in Germany, but on March 14, 2020, the whole country went in quarantine, so whole motion swiped off and 
we had other things to deal with. Um, nonetheless, um, it's still something that I try to uh, work in government to see how to change the idea of giving informed consent. Um, and here you can see some overview of people participating over the years. Um, really fun thing to do. So let's move to autonomy. With that project of 0 0.01 for six seconds, I tried to map the whole kind of infrastructure of these privacy policies, of these uh, consent structures. But with a new project continuing in that, I wanted to also kind of map the way that data is actually traced about us. So what are companies collecting about me? What are com companies collecting about all of us? Um, and how do they share that with a lot of people? So I did a lot of data requests. Data requests are really fun to do, I think. Um, under the European law, we can request any type of company to access all of our data, and they have to give that within 30 days. Most bigger companies do it in, within minutes because they have it generated. Um, so here you can actually look at me, or at least a representation of me, of my interest profiles through Meta. And this really amazed me because these are 110, I think, 14 character, characteristics about me that Meta has given me for any type of person, uh, any type of reason, uh, based on all the data that they're collecting about me. But it also looks like a very random collection of words, <laughs> to be honest. Things like the American Mathematical Society or prefectures of Japan. I don't know that you could be interested in types of things like that. But also very general words like sun or green. Green color. It's specified color. There's also a green party just below, so like a political green. But this really said, you like green. And I started thinking, do I like green? Do I favor green over other colors? I probably will say that uh, pink is my favorite color, actually. So I was like, how do they know that I like green? And do they know that I like green better than I do myself? Or do they just make me want to like green so they can, I don't know, target me with stuff? So I started the project, Why I Like Green. <laughs> and Why I Like Green is a search for data to confirm whether or not I like green. Um, so I started to map out this whole infrastructure of how Meta collects information, because I was really sure I haven't used Facebook in probably like five years or so, not active at least. Still have the account for research reasons, um, <laughs> but I was kind of interested. So I did a data request at Facebook, and I saw 94 folders, which are a lot of folders. And in every folder, think about... Um, rejected friend requests, event pages, seen content, likes. You can have tons of data, like everything that you even like scrolled on through Facebook, they collect and they store. So from those folders, I chose one, the event data. And from that folder, I chose one particular point and then also looked at um, the last event that I went to and then others who went to that event as well. I hope you're following me. So what they basically want to do is tie you, like they want to categorize you in you and people like you. So pe other people who also went to those events, they can probably also direct some kind of uh, interest from that as well. So that's how I structured it. Otherwise, it would be like endless piles of data. So we have the folder, we have one data, we have uh, all the folders, we have one folder, and we have one sp specified data section in that folder, and then we have one data point and others who like that too. But I mean, it's quite evident that Meta is collecting information about me through Facebook. They also access data through a lot of other points, things like your active cookies on your devices that you've logged in with. So think about your Mac or your phone. It's still recording everything. Also, uh, the installed applications, when you open them, how you interact with them, really kind of intricate information to uh, collect about people. But then we can continue because they also buy a lot of companies. Uh, things like Instagram, WhatsApp, Oculus, and they also collect a lot of information through them. But they also use this 
thing like authentication by Facebook. So they allow you to, to uh, log in to other platforms with your Facebook account, which they sell very cleverly as super server-centric, you know? You don't need to make a new account for every time that you want to uh, enter a new platform. But it's actually a backdoor for them into that data as well. So that's super clever. And they also invented the, this thing called the pixel. Probably you're familiar with it. So it's similar to a cookie technology. They just place it on different type of websites, and then they can also extract all different types of information from there as well. So I structured it in the same way I did with the Facebook data. So I chose Instagram, I did again the data request, all the folders <laughs> that you could access, the scene co post and content. So not anything that I particularly interact with, but just scrolling through the timeline and then just passing for less than a second, and then they record it as well. So they know a lot about how you behave and how you scroll, how you interact with things. From there, I chose one post, uh, and others who also interacted with that post. I also did it for the authentication part, I did it with Spotify, uh, the streaming history, the personalized mixes, um, and the last part, people always really like this, because I used Bumble, a dating application that I used during uh, corona, I think a lot of people did. Uh, but the interesting part is, when you do a data request there, you can also access the conversations that you had, all in one text editor file, all in a row. But it's highly curated, because it's only your part of the conversation. So they share with you like everything that you ever said on these applications, but not what the other people actually said back to you. So it's a very <laughs> one-dimensional conversation. And they do that because of privacy con concerns, of course. Um, Meta can access the conversation, though, but I can't. So that's interesting. And then the final part was that I looked at people who liked me, which I didn't like back. Uh, and I ditched the app very, <laughs> very rapidly after. Um, so there you see it, a whole kind of universe of how Meta collects information about me and probably directing me towards liking green. Oh. And as an artist, I can make these very nice infographics and structures, but I also make, want to make it tangible. I want to give it some volume. So what I did here, I, from every uh, part of this research, I did a couple of hundred data points and I started to print them on ping pong balls with this really cute robot. I call her Mac. We spend a lot of time together. Uh, <laughs> probably again up to like 400 hours. I do this crazy labor intense projects always. Um, and I started to write down all this data about me. So I ended up with about 4,000 pieces of data, um, which is a lot. It's also very. <laughs> Yeah, it's light, but it's a lot of volume. So I was thinking about a way how to present this whole data set, how to um, make people aware of these kind of very intricate, very personal matters that they are all combining and piling up and just try to, I don't know, understand conclusions from. So I was thinking about what will be the next step, and then I actually got an invitation from a very big festival in the Netherlands called Lowlands. It's a music festival with up to 70,000 people, and they asked me if I want to create an installation for their festival in 2022, so last summer, about the uh, bias in algorithms, because I did a project for the government uh, previously. And I was very interested in actually having the starting point of all this data about me and trying to understand how our algorithms actually biased and you know, pro profiling you in certain ways. Can I understand that in a very kind of fun, accessible manner? So I tried to first create kind of a structure for showing these ping pong balls, all these data, um, and then evaluated this or developed it into a project called Dear Data, How Do You Decide My Future? And it is an interactive installation about the decision-making process of algorithms and why that is the process is not neutral. So there we encounter not only autonomy, but also equality. And I mean, there's more layers to it, but to kind of make it understandable for people, I summarized it in kind of four stages of the algorithm. So there is the collection of data, there's the categorization of data, there's the classification of data, and there's the profiling in the end. I mean, there are more layers to it, but to kind of have it structured in some way. So 
with the categorization of data, I think we <laughs> covered that part quite intensely. Um, we have this whole infrastructure. And then I created this kind of way to actually display all these ping pong balls in actually a physical infrastructure. Um, so here it's, um, I never know how to call this, um, a steel construction with a lot of balls. Let's keep it like that. Um, showing the 4,000 ping pong balls in a kind of a four meter long construction. And it's an interactive one uh, because people can also touch my balls and try to figure out what kind of um, things that I'm interested in, the conversation that I had. And people actually went pretty far because you know, they were literally like, crawling under to get to know me a little better. And it's fun, of course, to understand more and more about me through this data, but it's also a selection of data, and that's actually the first stage of a bias, because there's also way more data to discover about me than just this part. So, yeah, uh, I asked a lot of people whether they could find data which is, was directing at me like in green, and people were actually looking for that. I think the most um, occurring thing was that I actually had conversations. I always get questions about this after my talk, so I thought maybe cover this first. <laughs> Um, there was a conversation where I said I wanted a turtle and I mentioned that I have a green suit because as you can tell I like to wear a color so sometimes I wear green never anymore um, so going into the next phase let me take a zip of water first going into the next phase I <laughs> encourage encourage people to also kind of play around with this data, not only touching it, but also kind of understand how an AI is understanding this data. Because we tend to think that AI is some kind of mystical creature or some oracle that is just there and all-knowing, but there's actually a lot of human labor in training the AI. So, uh, and whereas human labor, there's also a human bias from people kind of projecting their own kind of ideas into it, probably unconsciously, but there is. So I wanted to create a game where people were kind of training this whole set of data about me in a not too heavy way, um, but I wanted to ask them to make one of two choices between words to categorize it at first place. And um, so they are categorizing the whole data set from um, the scene content and post from the Instagram set. So these are 300 uh, ping pong balls. And funny enough, I saw that this picture was in there. And in 2006, the first rule in content moderation with Facebook was the no nipple policy, saying if there is a nipple present in the picture, we do not allow it on Facebook. That's outrageous. We don't want a nipple. But we don't want a female nipple. Male nipples were, of course, allowed. Except from when there was a newborn attached to the nipple, then it was fine. So you can see that there was a whole world of content moderation evolved from that first no nipple policy. So interesting here, because we can see a nipple, we can also question, I mean, it's kind of also a sculpture or a piece of art. So people had to make, had like two seconds to make very quick decisions. Here as well, is it food or is it not food? That will also be based on your opinions, on your beliefs. How does that work for concepts like light or dark? How do we categorize this? Because we need to understand it. Um, do we see a human or do we see an animal? And how to distinct that? But also, is this feminine or is this masculine, because when we're deciding it's one of either, it will also exclude a lot of other things. And the game worked in a way that they, people saw the first picture, like zoomed in first, but then the context changed. So it was a zoomed out version, and we also kind of measured will people make different choices when they have a bigger context, because again, data taken out of context or not having a full picture can also increase the bias about it. So that was kind of how that game worked. Um, following up on that, there's also a classification part of it. So um, think about, for example, if you want to hire uh, a person for the job and for a job and want to optimize the first process of that with an AI, and you ask, "Give me the smartest person for the job." Well, your idea of smart will probably also integrate in the question. Um, so my idea of being smart 
uh, will probably be different than everybody else's. It can be either a certain degree, it can be um, a certain IQ, but it can also be a certain look, and probably we're not aware of that is, that is the way that we encounter smart. So the parameters that we set are defining also the answer. I call that the definition of success. So I, we again, training this whole data set, um, but then with things, uh, with nine options and a word like happy or dirty, healthy. I mean, how to define healthy? Um, and if we say this is healthy and this is not healthy, how will that affect a lot of other people? Um, what is pure or what is normal? All these are things that we actually try to question. And there's not right or wrong there, but I think that we have seen over the years that many people, co companies, also governments, are kind of hiding behind the seemingly objectivity of these algorithms saying it's just data and statistics. And now it's, you know, not biased, but I mean, if we're the ones asking the questions, if we're the ones integrating the data, if we're the ones trading the data, we can't avoid the bias. So we have to find ways to minimize that. We have to think about, is there a diverse team behind it? Um, is, it is the data representing our society? All these kind of things, which is often not done, which is highly effective. And these games were also kind of self-learning. So um, yeah, it was all kind of part of this bigger intelligence that I'm creating. <laughs> That's not. Um, so profile by data, um, it's kind of summing up all the things that I did in this installation. Um, we've seen it a little bit in the beginning. It's actually a conversation between me and my data. Asking it, um, why do you think that I like green? Why do you think that I like Paul? Um, and I think the most important thing there to ask is, what is the incentive of profiling me in a certain way? Um, does it guide me to what I really want to find or what it, whatever it is, want me to find? Um, so I think these are questions that we really kind of also have to uh, understand in a way um, that we're using these kind of technologies. And a bigger question that I wanted to ask with this project actually is, um, do, does data or do you, I'm asking the data, know me better than I know myself or don't you know me at all? And I ask that um, in a way of fake tattoos. So during this festival, everybody who entered um, the space, entered the installation, got, to, uh, got a question in the end, like, do you think that, I mean, after seeing all this data about me, scrolling to uh, my information, categorizing it, making it, making it understandable, do you think that you know me? And some people said, yeah, I do, because now I know that you said that and that you like this and that you visited that website. Some people also think, well, maybe people are more complex than just a bench of data, or this is also just a segment of you. There's so much more to it. Um, so that was a very interesting experiment to have people also choose, and it actually also led to people on the festival having conversation about what knowing actually really means. Um, so that's a new way of kind of also introducing this kind of um, topics to have people... I'm, I'm, I will not say that there is a right or wrong answer here, but it's nice to actually encourage people to uh, think about this. Do you think that data can represent you as a person, if you have all the data, maybe, or not? Um, I'm wondering, maybe it's nice to see who will choose... I do know, Julia. Yes, you're again my favorite audience. I was also wearing a don't. Um, so, um, there, that being said, we can move to the final project that I want to pre present tonight, um, which is also about this kind of identity based on data. Because nowadays we see more often that they profile you in not only this is the best choice, but also back it up with statistics, so they say we are 94% sure that you will like this title. You probably recognize it from Netflix. I think it's highly fascinating, um, highly fascinating how that works. Um, because what these platforms, I think, are aiming for is what we call frictionlessness. So if they know everything about you as much as possible, 
they can give you the best experience. You will never have to choose yourself again. Think about Spotify, who is kind of, you know, you just click on a song and you kind of flow with the waves of that kind of sound and they will just present the next one and the next one. You will never have to choose again. It's really frictionless. But with frictionlessness, there is also a lot of obedience. And I think it's hard to distinct them from each other. So we also let these algorithms dictate the things that we're liking. And we can question um, what part of our identity are they appealing to as well. So I found it very fascinating that Netflix does that very aggressively, but also uh, Google Maps is integrating these backed up statistics uh, and percentages. So they now show you a restaurant and how much it will match your previous visited restaurants or a store. And I think it's an interesting development <laughs> which I don't understand yet. So that's why I did a new project. <laughs> and I wanted to kind of counter that idea of frictionlessness with the right to be forgotten. The right to be forgotten um, is a right that we have under the GDPR again, that we can uh, ask a company to erase our data. And I think it's very important. And when I started this new project, I thought I want to make the right to be forgotten more important, more understandable for people. But then I started thinking, like, how does the right to be forgotten really work? Like, I've showed in all my research and projects that this data is instantly multiplied. So if I ask a Daily Mail to erase my data, all those 835 other companies still have it. So on a practical level, how does the right to be forgotten really applies? But it's actually also a quite philosophical con uh, concept if you think about it. What does it mean to be forgotten in a world that is built on data? And I started thinking about all these kind of structures and ideas and philosophical developments, and I thought it's interesting to kind of question um, the idea of what I call the oblivion. The oblivion I see as a state of um, not having a past and not having a future on the internet. So not being traced by data and not being profiled in some matter, because that will give you some freedom. But then I started to think about it, and I felt like, well, but then you also don't have the frictionlessness, because then they c cannot give you kind of the right options that you probably will like. So <laughs> I started to kind of spin around this idea of obedience, frictionlessness, freedom, um, and obliviated. And I wanted to make some kind of measurement towards it, but that's really kind of hard, so it's a process that I've been working, I'm going to be working on for the next couple of years. So I decided to make a new project, but also kind of continue on this research for a while. Um, and I was actually thinking about all of this while, and <laughs> while I was in this swimming pool. And the swimming pool is in Bali. And I went to Bali last winter. I never imagined myself going to Bali, because I thought everybody's going to Bali, and I will not go to Bali. But I had a holiday, I really needed to take a time off work, because I was really stressed out with working on this lawsuit in secret for about a year, so I thought, okay, Julia, this is your time, you need to have a break, but I only had 12 days between a lecture and Christmas, and I wanted to be with my family for Christmas. So I thought, what is a nice, safe option to really be out of my own space, but not having to travel all the time, have kind of a safe option where everything will be there, you know, jungle, hiking, culture, different types of food, but also be kind of safe. So I went to Bali, which was an odd choice. People also said, like, Yula, you're really going to Bali? I was like, yes, I'm going to Bali. But in the end, it was actually a really nice experiment because I was constantly drawn towards either going to these very weird, shiny places, like this, or going to the jungle to hike, because my other holidays are always hiking in the mountains. And, or not always, but like a lot. I recently went to Balkan, highly recommended, really nice, from Montenegro, Kosovo, Albania. Anyways, um, so I was here because I felt like I need some kind of day where it will be just nice, you know, not just 
walking around, browsing around, where I would just have a relaxed, chill day. So I looked at Google Maps, and then this was recommended to me. So I felt like, sure, why not? It looks very shiny, it looks very nice. But being there, I noticed that this river below was actually my favorite part, because that was just there already, and it was random, and it was kind of you know, unsecure and unexpected, and just the way the world is. So I felt like this is kind of interesting <laughs> that we want kind of the smoothness, the shyness, the comfort that is created in this kind of, I don't know, very odd place and everybody is taking selfies and it's kind of created to not be forgotten. It's actually a world that is created to be, I don't know, safe and nice. And then the other part is where, yeah, the rest of it. Anyways, so I thought it's kind of interesting because I was doubting whether I like it or not, but I also felt it's not my responsibility that I have, that I, that I decided to. So I couldn't blame Google for liking it or not liking it because I just went by the recommendation. And if I were, went to go, uh, were to go, you know, just having my own path, I will blame myself for maybe not choosing right or left. So um, I think this is a phenomenon uh, which I see with this kind of platformization that we feel like we never have to decide really again, because we can just rely on the AI. Um, so I draw this line from the swimming pool. I used it as the foundation of this new project where I was kind of mapping this idea of have, making choices based on percentages. And I was really interested in Netflix doing that, and I happened to share an account with my dad and my grandmother. And I thought it was actually really nice, so I could surveil their <laughs> watching behavior for a while. And I thought it's actually also kind of interesting to see that there is also kind of a family story there um, made by the way that Netflix is presenting titles. Um, so what I did, um, Netflix in the Netherlands offers about 7,000 titles. But they show you, or everyone, about 300 every day, between 55 and 99% sure that you will like it. So as for the background of the installation, I mapped all the searchable content, so the, uh, the 7,000 titles, into the genres, so these are the things, and I repeated that pattern three times, for me, for my dad, and for my grandmother. And I started to make little flags based on this kind of line draw from the swimming pool uh, and started to place them on these patterns based on my behavior and my father's behavior and my grandmother's behavior. Um, and it looks like this. So in all those titles, they will kind of guide you through all the content because think about have to, having to navigate through something like Netflix without having some kind of navigation system through AI, because that will be super overwhelming, searching all those 7,000 titles. I mean, now it's also, I mean, it's all shitty content, so it's already hard to decide. Um, but having this kind of way through it, it's kind of nice, it's kind of frictionless. They will, you will just open it and say like, okay, you will probably like this now, you, re you really don't want to make a choice, so we just go for it. So you can see that they're curing the kind of different type of patterns for me, my father, and my grandmother. Uh, and it's looking like this, uh, where you can see, for example, on the left that, my, that, that I am really much profiled into liking reality shows. And I actually never watched reality shows, but they probably thought like, oh, she liked Emily in Paris, so she'll also probably be a person who will like keeping up with the Kardashians. I don't know. So they kind of draw these <laughs> kind of narratives from there. My grandmother actually was profiled in Korean horror movies. And that... <laughs> it's true. Uh, it's on the top right there. And that woman had never left her small village uh, in the Netherlands. So I was highly, highly surprised by that result. So either she was looking... Like she was similar to people who were liking Korean horror movies, or she really had a craving for that. Um, the thing is, I mean, with Netflix, it's rather questionable whether it's, it's, it's bothering that we rely on these systems to make choices. But I think it's phenomenon, like uh, with Google Maps now, that we don't allow the unexpected. We don't want to be responsible for our own choices, and we want to be safe. We don't want to make kind of a weird 
turn because there is so much out there, there's so many good content, there's so many good things to do. What if w will happen when you choose wrongly, when you do something that you don't like? So we create this kind of safety patterns to just be kind of comfortable. Um, but how do we allow the unexpected to happen in these kind of worlds? So what I did with the video installation on the bottom, I had this conversation with myself and my, my dad and my grandmother about bigger questions in life and whether, it will not, will not, whether or not it will be desi desirable um, to have those backed up with statistics. So I asked myself, like for example, while I was using the dating application, whether what will happen if it didn't say like um, the name and the age, but also you'll be probably like 62% sure that you will go on a second date with that person. How will that influence my decisions? I asked my uh, father if he would have become a doctor um, if he knew that there was only a certain amount, like a 32% chance of being successful at it. I asked myself, did I become an artist if I was sure that there was a very, very tiny percentage that I will be successful at it? All these kind of bigger questions. I asked my grandmother, um, if she would have dated my grandfather if there was not a very high uh, probability of having a successful marriage, all these kind of bigger questions. That I also want to ask you, like if you, for example, have kids growing up now, think about kids now being five, six, seven years old, and just by their nature and by their DNA and by all the data that's already available about them, they will show you, okay, you have a 10% chance of being a successful ballet dancer, 88% um, chance of having a successful career in this, like how will that interfere with our lives? And how will it interfere with us being human in the end? So that is how I also want to close this evening, uh, or at least my presentation part. If we increasingly live within the mere margins of algorithms, what does it really mean to be human? And what is the purpose of being here? That's it for now. Thank you.